Proverbs chapter 19 is where we are. We made our way down through verse 11. And we're going to pick it up this morning in verse 12 and see, I ate up a lot of time, but we're going to see what the Lord gives us. So if you're with me, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 12, please say amen. amen. The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. A foolish son is the ruin of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dripping. Thank y'all. Nobody said amen. Y'all are learning. <laughs> Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Here we go. Hey, so y'all get it. This is awesome. This is why all the guest pastors who come here to speak try to trade with me. And I tell them, nope, nope. They want to switch congregations. Like, nope, that ain't happening. All right. Verse 15, laziness casts one into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. He who keeps the commandment keeps his soul, but he who is careless of his ways will die. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay back what he has given. A wonderful verse. Um, chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. A man of great wrath will suffer punishment for if you rescue him, check this out, you will have to do it again. We'll stop there. Father, we just thank you this morning for your word, Lord God, and for the text that you put before us. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to it. Lord, I pray that you would teach us by your spirit, that you would remove all the things that hinder from this room, all of, Lord, the works of the enemy, um, the, the cares of this life, the burdens of this world that may be on our heart, and even the distractions from the room, electronic devices, all things of that sort. Lord, I pray that you would subdue all things, that you would take this hour as your own, and that you would grab a hold, Lord, of our attention and that you would pour into us and continue to transform us to the image of your son. That we would leave this place even different than the way we came in. In Jesus' name, we love you. We thank you. We surrender to that. And we say together, amen, amen. So we dive in. The king's wrath is like the roar of a lion, but his favor is like the dew of the grass. I think I got into this a little bit last week in this service, but was not able to get it to it in the second service. And it's just a contrast. Remember, Solomon is the king. He is writing to his children to give them wisdom that they need to navigate this world. His heart is that they would be uh, successful and victorious as walking with the Lord as believers. And that is what the Holy Spirit intends to do with us and in us through the book of Proverbs. And so we look at the contrast. The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion. When a lion roars, I mean, there, there's a couple of things going on. Of course, in the lion's mind, when he roars, he is warning his enemies, those who are in, 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 encroaching on, or approaching on his territory because lions are very territorial. He's letting them know this is my area. Okay, the lioness are mine and any food here is mine. He's letting them know that. Um, and so he's warning his, um, his adversaries. And when they roar back, it's his way of testing their strength. And they can tell by the roar what kind of line they're dealing with. And so in the natural, all of these things are happening. But the reality is, is when the lion roars, it strikes terror in all of the, the animals in the area. Um, and it lets them know that there is the presence of a lion and it causes them to be on alert. And so when the king's wrath is being uh, spoken of here, it's like the roaring of a lion because when the king is angry, rightfully so, um, it should strike terror because the king has the authority and the ability to, if you will, to deal with things and to punish things. And so um, there should be some type of, uh, if you will, respect for the king in such a way that it strikes a terror that causes people to do things that they should be doing and not do things that would go against the king. 
In contrast, his favor is like dew on the grass, which we spoke of last week. Dew on the grass in ancient times, uh, in agrarian society, dew on the grass meant refreshment. It meant flourishment. It meant uh, prosperity because the agriculture was going to do well. And it's amazing to me um, when I walk out in the morning to inspect my Bermuda grass in the spring and in the summer, how much uh, actual drops of water I can see on them and it hasn't rained. Isn't that amazing to anybody other than me? I'm like, man, Lord, you are watering the grass. You give them that that reviving first thing in the morning for that 90 degree weather before it shows up and just refreshing them. And, And so a king's favor is like that as well. And so the contrast is seen here and it it speaks to us listen that we want to avoid the wrath of the authority of the king and we want to be in the king's favor here on earth that's not always possible especially for believers in the time we live in it's great when it can happen But often now it seems as though we find ourselves not in the graces of the king because the policies that the kings and the prime ministers of the world are making are not in in favor, if you will, of those who believe in the king of glory. So therefore, we're going to find ourselves more and more in opposition to that. So then what I should be seeking more than anything is the favor of the king of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ to walk in his graces and his mercy and in his favor, um, that I am not the subject of his wrath because how many of you remember what the scripture says? We have not been appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation, amen? So the good news is I'm walking in his grace. I'm not the target of his wrath. And so therefore, no matter what happens down here, my eternal destiny is already secure. And that's a good thing. And so when I look at the verse, I see that contrast above all others because that's one that I can always walk in and you can always walk in. Amen. Amen. And God is so good. Notice in verse 13, when I move, we've been picking up our pace the last few weeks. Verse uh, 13 says, a foolish son is the ruin of his father. And of course, we understand that there's been many verses in the book of Proverbs before that talks about the foolish son bringing a disgrace Um, being the heartache of his father and of the mother. And so we've seen that. And of course, every parent, um, when they, when you hold that baby in your arms, you have such high hopes, don't we? Oh, we can just see the world and anything we can do to, to, to push them forward and make them successful. That's what we want to do. And so it hurts our heart when they go in the wrong direction. Remember, I always say that the place we want to point our children is towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our, our goal is for them to come to know him above all things because then their eternity is secure. And if they learn to walk with him, then he leads their path. So we, we love that. And we, that's what we desire. But in the natural, a foolish son is the ruin of his father. But notice the contrast he says here, and a contentious wife is a continual dripping. Interesting, contentious. Um, Solomon kind of had his own language, I guess, growing up there in the palace as uh, the son of a king and then being a king. And and it seems that sometimes he uses words that are kind of isolated within the book of Proverbs. Here's one. This word contentions is only used In the book of Proverbs, the only place you find this word in the Old Testament used nine times in the book of Proverbs. We have translated it seven times as contention and then two times it's been translated as brawling, Um, brawling I like. And so um, the thing is to get a woman to the place of brawling, that takes some time. So, but the context, we want to stay in the context. The context here is specifically the contentions of a wife. Um, And if you take this verse out of context, we can have a lot of fun with it and we can create a male friendly message that's not balanced. The greater context of this would then fit within the book of Proverbs as a whole, as well as the whole Bible. And so in the greater context, we can look at Proverbs 18.22 as well. Whereas if you look back at Proverbs 18.22, it says, he who finds a what, y'all? Finds a what? Good thing. And obtains favor from the Lord. So the wife, by title and position, she's more honorable, more desirable, 
and more pleasing than a woman in general or even than a girlfriend. Say amen, husbands. Yeah, she's something different altogether. So the Bible calls the wife, check it out, a good thing. And she comes with benefits. She comes with everything that is needed, guys. Y'all hang with me for a moment. This is what the Bible says about a wife. You know, guys, maybe you go pick up a, 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 new, a new chainsaw. And I like, I like things that have everything I need in it when I get it. So maybe you go get a craftsman. You get your craftsman. You get it home. It's in, and you take it out the box. You find with that craftsman chainsaw that you've got to put the bar on and get it set. You've got to get the chain on and set just right. Um, then you've got you've to get your oil in. You've got to get your gas in. You might even have to sharpen the chain. But then you realize you don't have the tool to sharpen it. So you've got to go back to the, to the store. You've got to get your sharpener. You've got to get um, the, the, the uh, chain oil. You've got to get the gas. You've got to mix it right because you're fooling with a craftsman chainsaw. If you go buy a steel chainsaw, I go pick my steel chainsaw up, the bar's on it, the chain is set, the chain is sharp, the oil is in it, the gas is in it, we walk outside, crank it up at the store and, and make sure it runs well. Then pick up an extra chain while I'm there and so by the time I get home, as soon as I hop out the truck, I can grab the steel, crank it up and I'm, I'm going right to work. That's kind of stuff I like getting. I can't stand to get a gift and then I can't use it because I got to go and get a bunch of extra stuff. Last year, my wife brought me a Oklahoma Joe wood smoker. I love that woman. She didn't just buy me. I'm thinking, she says, hey, I need to use your truck because I want to go get your birthday gift. I'm like, okay, so I'm riding with her to Lowe's, and I'm excited, and, and she tells me what it is. I'm thinking there's going to be this big box, and we're going to load it up, and I'm going to go home and have fun having to put it together and all this stuff. No, 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 no. She paid to have them put it together for me, and she bought a cover for it. So I, I wouldn't just be out in the rain rusting. She did everything because a wife is a good thing. <laughs> Amen. And so the context here is the, continue, the con, uh, contentious wife or the contentions of a wife are continual dripping. But I have to say, and I'm going to try to be balanced here. I have to say if your wife is contentious, You have a good thing, but that has not been used or treated according to maybe the manufacturer's specifications, like trying to use your chainsaw to cut the grass or um, something like that maybe. And so if you are not experiencing the favor of the Lord in your marriage, you got to refer back to the manufacturer's instructions. What does he say do? One area, 1 Peter 3, 7 Husbands likewise dwell with them according to understanding. Always a challenging part of it because, you know, a wife has to be understood, meaning that we have to be paying attention, <laughs> getting to know, um, pursuing, um, paying attention to, learning. Um, man, there are guys, I see guys with tools and they know how to tweak them and fix them and set them and they got all these extra tools to take care of the one tool that they have. You know, you know how we are, guys. Likewise, with the wife, she is to be understood, she is to be pursued, she is to be uh, cherished and honored. So likewise, uh, dwell with them according to understanding, but then giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Your wife may not be weak, but you treat her as the weaker vessel. I always like to look at it this way. I love drinking out of mason jars. You put the ice in it, then you put the beverage in, and then you let it sit until the outside sweats. And then it's perfect. And then you drink your water. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, but the wife is to be treated more like a crystal, crystal wine glass of some sort. Something that my, my mother growing up would not let me get near because I would break it. They're really thin. Ladies, you know what crystal is? So treat the wife like the crystal, even if she's strong. Um, and he says here, and as being heirs together of the grace of of life because both the husband and the wife are heirs together the promises and the, and the wonderful things of God that your prayers notice at the end of the verse may not be hindered and that's where the scary part comes in husbands um, and so look if you're not experiencing the favor of the Lord maybe your prayers are being hindered because you've got to go back and learn how to treat the wife because if you notice the verse again look at the verse again I'm gonna move on in a minute and the contentions of a wife are a continual dripping um, a continual dripping it's kind of like um, that, 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 leak, that leak in the roof that drives you crazy 
and you can't sleep and you can't even think because it's dripping. Anybody ever had that experience? And it's dripping, you can't sleep, you can't, you know, you put the bucket there and then you hear that, it's hitting the bucket, you know, and it's, it's just a constant drip and it's driving you crazy. But it's been my experience with water leaks that they start out very small. In fact, before they begin to leak, there's a, usually an indication that they're about to leak. There's a spot in the ceiling because the water's building up on the other side. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We used to have one right here. We, we fixed it, painted it. I can still see the spot. It drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then it begins to leak. And so what I found is that that leaking, that, that it builds over time if the problem is not dealt with. And I want to challenge you guys that if, if, you, if you look at the verse and, and you, your first indication is, I know what that's like, that continual dripping, I have to say it probably has continued and increased because something wasn't taken care of way back when that could have been taken care of to avoid the continual dripping. Um, because the Bible says a wife is a good thing and, and, and most wives don't start off dripping from the beginning. They don't drip on the honeymoon like that. You know, it's not like that and it, it builds over time. And so it may be, husbands, as we read this verse and something jumps in your heart that I would challenge you that maybe there's some things that you need to do at home that could, could literally take that dripping away. And the Lord would say to love her as Christ has loved the church, to deal with the things that are being brought before you. But ladies, at the same time, you have to realize that the Bible is comparing your contention, your anger, your frustration, that some of it may be well warranted, but it's, it's comparing it to a continual dripping. It means your nagging, your constant reminders, your constant words are actually making um, are not making a difference, but making things worse. It doesn't fix anything when you try to be the Holy Spirit with many words constantly all the time, day after day after day after day. He's not going to do anything about it. It's going to push you all further and further apart. In fact, we see this same word used a couple of the times in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 21.9 says, better to dwell in a corner of a housetop then in a house, share it with the contentious woman. Guys, don't say amen. <laughs> Listen to your pastor. Just sit there and say nothing. Solomon said it's better to go live at the corner of the roof, in the rain, in the rain, than in the house with the contentious woman. That's what Solomon just said. But she wasn't contentious when you took her home from the church after the wedding. Okay. Her contention is, is the product of your leadership or lack thereof. Proverbs 27, 15 says, a continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Now, remember what I told you. Solomon can tell us these things because he had a thousand women on his payroll that were either his wife or his concubine. And so he, he, he understands this because he didn't do it the right way. So then let me challenge the ladies, though. So then your many words are not going to fix the problem. Let's go back to Peter again. Same chapter, 1 Peter 3, 1, through, 1 and 2 says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without, ladies, you underline it, your husband wants to in your Bible, but you underline it, without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accomplished by fear. Remember, it's, it's how you conduct yourself as a godly woman that brings conviction, conviction into your husband's heart because the Holy Spirit can take your actions, your, 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 um, your godliness, how you trust the Lord and how you serve the Lord. God can take that and it's like a dagger in your husband's heart when the Holy Spirit uses it. Because he, he, he can, the Holy Spirit can say, you look at how amazing she is and how she's following me and being patient and you're being a knucklehead. It works, ladies. I've seen it in my own life. The Lord dealt with me when my wife was just serving the Lord. And the Lord then can get to your husband and begin to change these things. Because the reality is, Scripture says a wife is a good thing when you receive her, guys, and you obtain favor from the Lord. So we got to balance these things out, which is why I love the next verse. The next verse tells us um, in verse 14, 
houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers. In other words, it's just a picture of what we know and understand. A good father leaves an inheritance for his children's children. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. We saw it early in the book of Proverbs. So we, we receive inheritances from our fathers for earthly things. But Solomon, who had a bunch of women and came to realize, verse 14, part B, a prudent wife is from the Lord. Amen? It's something that God blessed us with, a prudent wife. And she becomes more and more prudent. She becomes more and more virtuous the longer she walks with the Lord and walks alongside her husband. It's a process. Um, these are the things that come from the Lord. And let me just say to the single guys, a prudent wife is from the Lord, meaning that you can't go necessarily and find her on your own because maybe you're, you're chasing something that you think you want. Um, but you need to trust the Lord. And, you know, I tell some young men all the time, some young men, they have these types, you know, because through, through the Internet and pornography and everything, you can, you know, you can choose your type. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm saying, look, put the type aside, get right with the Lord and trust the Lord. Amen. And let him bring a prudent woman, a virtuous woman, and let him prepare you to love her. Um, see, the problem with marriage is that husbands and wives are not willing to put in the work to see a marriage flourish. And the work has to be put in. Instead of you constantly looking at your spouse and what they're not doing or what they're doing wrong, the Bible is saying, no, look at yourself and are you doing that which, ha which has been required of you as a husband or as a wife? Are you doing the things that the scripture has commanded you to do? Focus on yourself and then you'll see God begin to work in your marriage. You have to put the work in. I'll come back to the work in a little bit when we get further down. All right, verse 15. Y'all ready to move on from that? I thought I would get a heavier amen there. <laughs> Laziness. And here we go. Solomon doesn't like the fool or the lazy person. Laziness casts one into a deep sleep. And an idle person will suffer hunger. And he talks about this quite a bit. Um, somebody who is idle, somebody who is not... Um, you know, employed themselves with, with being diligent and, 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 and hard working in some uh, form of life. It doesn't matter what it is. We should always, as people who are following the Lord, as believers, we're always being diligent in something because God is always putting something before us to get done. There's always something that needs to be done. After we've spent time with the Lord, he shows us where we need to be of service. Somebody is in need. Something needs to be taken care of, whether it's within the home, within the community, with on the job or within the church. And so Solomon speaks about this a lot. Laziness casts one into a deep sleep. A person is sleep, uh, slothful and slumbers and does not want to get up and be productive. And this person's going to fall behind. A person who's idle, they haven't filled their life with things that are, are needful to be done, meeting the needs of someone else, if, if, if not yourself. This person will suffer hunger. We are built to do this. And in fact, in the Bible, what do we see? The first six days of creation, the Lord is working, if you will, resting on the seventh day showing us a pattern. And so for believers, we are to be diligent. Um, we, need to do, we need to take time for rest, but then we need to get right back to, to work. And it doesn't mean we have to work hard and wear ourselves out, but we do need to be productive in our lives. And the, the more efficient we can be at the things that we're doing, the more we accomplish. And that's, that's Christianity. Verse 16. Verse 16 says, he who keeps the commandment keeps his soul. Remember, we talked about that earlier um, the person who loves knowledge loves his soul. So those who keep the commandment keeps his soul. Because as you're keeping the commandments of the Lord, as you're walking with the Lord and being obedient to him, you are preserving your own soul. But to, to go against the Lord, to go against the, the word of God is to really bring, uh, if you will, a curse against your own soul, to sear your own conscience, to, to, to cause you to become dull towards the things of God um, and begin to move away from him. And it's a very subtle thing. And Satan's crafty enough to wait it out. He will observe you. And, and, and I will say this. I know for a fact today that there's somebody, if it's this service or second service, that is struggling because it's been a spiritual battle for me this morning. And whenever it's intense like that leading up to a service, it's because somebody needs to hear something that the Lord is saying. So he who keeps the commandment keeps his soul, but he who is careless of his way will die. Careless of his way, meaning is not walking according to the commands of God. 
and Solomon is speaking to his children who he's poured the word into and likewise the Holy Spirit is speaking to believers in this room. Are we going to keep the commands of God? Are we going to walk with, with him in his, according to his word? Or are we going to be careless? Are we going to allow ourselves to be led astray into things that we absolutely know are not the way that God would have us to do them and, and compromise? And it says that he who is careless of his way will die. Verse 17, he who has pity on the, on the poor. We talked about this last week. Lends to the Lord. I love the language. To have pity on the poor is to actually lend to the Lord. Guess what? God ain't going to never be in debt to you. And that's why the next verse, part of the verse says, and he will pay back what he has given. And so it causes us to become balanced, as I shared with you last week, and, and how we view the poor. It's very easy for Christians to get high-minded against those who are poor and try to evaluate why they're in the situation they're in. Have they not been diligent? Um, has it, is it a drug issue? Um, what's going on with this person? Why are they that way? And all of this kind of stuff. And try to justify not wanting to help. And remember, I've shared with you many times is that the Holy Spirit has moved through the church over the last 2,000 years to do way more work than any government or collection of governments have done towards those who are in need. Governments will generally either let people be homeless, sleep like, you know, Raleigh, Garner area, sleep in the woods, or they'll give them a shelter, which most homeless people I've spent time around don't want to go to the shelter because the shelter is worse than sleeping in the woods. Because it's in the shelter that women get raped or children get raped or drugs find their way in. People steal from each other. There's abuse. People get beat up. It's amazing what happens in the governmental shelter. Okay. And so, so we see that. Then a Christian organization will come along and start some type of outreach ministry that provides, like what we see, saw down in Georgia, a safer place. The church has, has built orphanages, schools, hospitals uh, throughout the last 2,000 years. And so when we think about this, our heart has to always be, well, this person who is poor is made in the image of God. So I can't always get to the root cause of what's going on in their life. But I need to be able to be sensitive to it so God can use me to minister to the need. And sometimes you don't have time to evaluate it and God may move on you to give money. And like I said last week, if you, if you know it's a drug issue, you don't give money, you buy food. But there may be time when you have to give money. And I always say that you give it to them in the name of Jesus and you let them know where it's coming from. Let them know so that the Holy Spirit can convict them if they misuse it. Because the, the, the point is, is when they come to their senses and they, and they realize that they need to come to God, they'll really remember every time Jesus came to them in the form of one of us and spoke to them the truth of God's word while meeting a, a practical need. The reality is when we minister to the needs of the poor in our community, we're lending to God and God repays and we don't do it for that. We do it to see souls saved. Amen. But God is the one that keeps record of all of that. Do you not know that everything that we do is being recorded, as I've told you before? On Judgment Day, the books will be opened and everybody who's not in Christ will be judged by everything that's written in those books. Only those of us who believe will be judged by the works of Christ. And so we're being the Lamb's Book of Life. Our name is found there. So we're not judged by our works. Isn't that a good news? Because if you ever sin once, then your works are flawed and you go to hell. But if you believe in Christ who had no sin but laid down his life for those who were in sin, well, then you're, you're justified by his works, by his blood. Amen? Amen? And so this is what we need to know and remember. All right, verse 18. Verse 18 says, chasten your son while there is hope. And do not set your heart on his destruction. Chasten your son while there is hope. The word chasten means discipline, instruct, admonish. While there is hope. When is there hope? When they are young. Train up a child in the way they are to go so that when they're old, they will not depart. So when they're young, the Bible says discipline them because that's when the hope is there. Because if you wait until they get too old, you've missed, you've missed the hope. Proverbs 13, 24, you remember we covered it, says he who spares the rod, what? Hates his son. What do you mean, Pastor Kevin? I love him. That's why I don't spank him. Because you're, you're listening to psychobabble. 
and being led by your emotions. So you actually think love is not spanking them. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth from a children's ministry perspective. When I did children's ministry, man, I, I told you before, I, I didn't like kids and didn't want to go to children's ministry. Then I fell in love with it. And they respected me because I was old school. I didn't know any other way to be. So when the boys cut up, I would drag them out of the room and put them on the floor of the hallway and make them do push-ups until their arms were like jello. And I was in there, go back in there and sit down and let's read, let's pray, let's talk about what this means. And then they wouldn't be disruptive, you know? And, you know, I would do stuff like that or if they would cut up, I would send them to the security guard, go sit with him until your parents come. Cause I'm not going to drag your parents out of service. They need the word. So I'm not going to put the name on the screen while you're in my class. Ain't no numbers going up on the screen. You're going to get disciplined in my classroom. I remember this little boy named Dustin. Dustin had the nerve to curse in my classroom. Boy, so I, I pulled him out. <laughs> he and I had a moment. But, you know, I didn't have the right to spank them because they weren't mine, so I never did that. But we had a moment. And, and, and you know, and so, um, but he, that was the last straw. So, but I didn't call his parents. But when they came, I called him out and I made him, I made him tell them what he said and he refused. So I told him. And he lied and said he didn't say it. That rascal had the nerve to lie. And I looked him in the eye and I didn't let go. And when I looked up, his mom had a tear in her eye because she knew how rotten he was. <laughs> Deep down, mom knew. And so dad was had pride. Dad didn't like how I was talking to his son. He was prideful, but mom knew what was going on. And so I told him, I said, look, this is what happened. I love him. He can come back to class. I want him here. But if you do that again, we're going to be right back here. Y'all need to go talk to him, you know, but I would deal with these things, you know, because it's important. So here it says if it, in the reference verse 1324, he who spares the rod hates his son. And when you spare the rod, you make it difficult for everybody else that has to deal with your child. The reality is do it while it's hope, while there's hope, because what's going to happen is when they get grown, they're going to get fired from the job, kicked out of school, arrested by the police because you spared the rod because you thought that was love. And scripture says you actually hate them. They're only on loan to you anyway. We're stewards. We don't even, we don't even, look, you know, they're not ours. They're his. We think we created them. We just created them through the process that he created so that they could come into the world so that they could hear the gospel and get back to him. That's the whole point of this thing called parenting. Now, let me plead with you on behalf of all of those in this church who work with youth across the way at the second service. If you allow them to spend all night on electronic devices where all the junk from the world is coming in, then you bring them here in hopes of something happening because all that, but all that junk they've been listening to and watching, all that, that crazy stuff that's happening, y'all, they can't hear the, the gospel from Pastor Jeffrey and the youth leaders. They can't hear because there's so much demonic um, glaze over. And that's what they're dealing with over there. And they only have them an hour a week, maybe two. So I plead with you to take away the devices at night. Don't allow them to have them in their room. And, um, and, I, and look, I dare one of them not to give you the code to the device that you pay for. If, if you can't have the code, they can't have the device. Come on, parents, work with me. And don't say amen unless you mean it. Go do it. We have to do this together, okay, because the world is destroying them. Look, man, it is the, the, the gender stuff, the LGBTQ stuff, the drug stuff, the, the crazy things that are going on. Um, there's stuff like Pastor Jeffrey, he used to pick on me by sharing this stuff with me. It's gotten so bad. He can't even show it to me anymore. He's like, it's one, he's like, I can't show you, Pastor Kevin. He's like, he was telling me about some dude that did this, some rap video that's basically gay. I don't even want to say the word. And he, he, it's, it was so bad that Pastor Jeffrey, he couldn't show it to me. That is just, it's gone. It's crazy. The world is gone. And we have to plead for them. But y'all, we live in such dangerous times is what I'm trying to say. It's not like when I, when I was coming up, man. You know, when I was coming up, it was, the, it just wasn't as dangerous. It, it seems worse now. It seems worse. You know, we have to think about how God is with us for a moment. Let's think. If you really know God personally, if you are born again, the spirit of God is in you, then you have to admit 
that he disciplines you. We're going to end in Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to turn there with me. I don't have that on the screen. If you're new to the Bible, it's to your right way towards the back, not all the way to the back, but in that direction. Past the Timothys and Titus and Philemon, and then you get the Hebrews, and chapter 12 is where we are. Now, this is speaking to all of us who are saved, and I love these verses where it reads uh, in verse 5, it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. And he's quoting the Old Testament. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Verse 7, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, meaning all of us who are believers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Let me make sure you understand the language. If you are without the chastening of the Lord in your life, then you are illegitimate. You are not a son. Therefore, if you are born again, then he's chastening you. And if he's not, then I, then, then I challenge you to make sure to examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Now, what do I mean by chastening? Well, I belong to the Lord. So when I do something I shouldn't, when I, when I stray away, when I drift, if I sin, there is strong conviction in my life from the Holy Spirit. And, and he doesn't let me rest and enjoy those things until I repent and get back right with him. You know, um, that's exactly what it is. I found that in my marriage. Whenever Lisa and I were having difficulty, you know, um, God would deal with me until I got it right. And see, here's the thing. When you ignore that over and over and over and over, he's then going to have to interrupt your life to bring you back because he loves you. You belong to him. You can't just, you know, do whatever you want as a child of God and get away with anything. He doesn't do that with us. He chastens us. He disciplines us. But why does he do it? The scripture just told us because he what? So then likewise, as parents and even grandparents, and it's harder as a grandparent, um, of course, I know it is because now, you know, our role is a little different. We just want to bring the love now. Um, so you may have to discipline your grown child who's refusing to discipline your grandchild. I don't know, <laughs> but we got to figure it out. The point is, y'all, let's pour into our children the love of God and the love of God is saying, no, you can't do, you can't have, that's not a- appropriate. We can't have this, you know, whatever you got to do, you know, and to deal with them so that you can bring them up in a godly way and see them walk with the Lord because times are different from when we were coming up. It's just different. All right. So that is where we are going to have to end. Because I'm over time and we're going to get more names on the screen if I keep going any longer. Um, so we'll stop there. No, no, one more verse. This is good. 19. I, got, I can't leave a singing. Because it, it, go, it goes with 18. Listen, listen. A man of great wrath will suffer punishment. We know that. Um, uh, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So there's going to be some punishment. But notice what it says next. And for if you rescue him. That this is good for parents and just those of us who fellowship with one another. If you rescue him, you will have to do it again. Parent, if you bail your child out when they're wrong, you might as well prepare to keep doing it. Because you've got to be a part of God dealing with the heart issue. This is where the chastening comes in. And this is the same. It could be your friend. If If you bail your friend out who has a problem and you don't deal with the heart of the issue, then you might as well get prepared to keep bailing them out and keep bailing them out and keep bailing them out. You know, I imagine there's probably somebody in here who had to sit in jail because a parent refused to come get them who would to it, who's thankful that their parent did that. So you got an amen in the back. Amen. Brother back there, because look, he sat there in jail and, and he had a chance to reflect <laughs> on things, you know, uh, so they, they need that. 
but you want to prevent them from getting there. So chasing them while they're little. Discipline, stay on top of things. Parents, just like being a, a, a spouse, you have to do the hard work now. You have to take the device away when it's bedtime. They will argue with you. It's okay. They will be upset with you. It's okay. I'm not afraid of my child being angry with me. So what? It doesn't say the wrath of a child, you know, was anything to be worried about. The wrath of the king, that's different. <laughs> so be mad. You know, parents, see, here's the problem. I got to end here. Biblically, it's time for God's parents to take back the biblical authority that was given to them that Satan has led the world to try to challenge you and tell you you don't have. And so the world is telling you you don't have the right or the authority to dictate to your children certain things. They're even telling you that you don't have the right to tell your child what they were born to be gender wise. And that, that you don't have to be involved in the decisions that they're making of their own body even younger than 12 years old. That's what the world is saying to parents. But biblically, parents need to take the authority back. God gave children to parents to bring them up the way he desired so that in the young years when they're not able to function on their own and think for themselves and hormones are going crazy and they're not mature, so he doesn't desire for them to make decisions about their life yet, he gave that authority to the parents so that they could do it until the children get old and then they can walk with the Lord. That's the biblical authority of the parent. Amen. And so um, we need to understand that because, hey, praise God, we get to go into the school system this year and do all of this outreach ministry. But let's make sure that we are doing it at home and within our own church as well. And that's for all of us because I'm still the parent of a teenager, too. And we got work to do. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you today, Lord God, for allowing us, Lord, to just hear your word. But, Lord, I pray that you would guide us through how to perform how to do these things that you say. And Lord, give us strength, give us favor, pour your spirit out upon us, Lord God, as we prepare for this week ahead, Lord, to keep us, to strengthen us, to give us discernment in every area. Lord, pour into the parents uh, and the grandparents, I pray this week, Lord God, all that is needful. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.